I thought we, we would begin by sharing a little bit about first how I met Mingyur Rinpoche. I met Mingyur Rinpoche in uh, 1995. And this was uh, at the meeting in Dharamsala, India with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, where the Dalai Lama grabbed me by the arm and said, I want you to take the practices from our tradition, turn them into a form that anybody can practice, into a more secular form, investigate them with rigorous tools of modern science, and if you find them to be valuable, disseminate them widely. And that has been my assignment for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you. So fortunately, um, Mingyur Rinpoche was there to hear His Holiness. Uh, and Mingyur Rinpoche at that time, I think, was 19. Uh, uh, and was just beginning to teach in the West. And uh, one of the things that became very clear to us early on is that in order for this work to proceed, we needed to work with practitioners who had some familiarity with Western culture and also who appreciated the role that science might play in promoting the more widespread distribution of these kinds of practices. Uh, and uh, uh, beginning in around uh, 2000, we turned our attention to this area in a major way. Uh, and Mingyur Rinpoche first came to our lab in Madison in 2002 and has made regular visits since then, for which we are very deeply appreciative. And when we first began this work, we wanted to work with people like Mingyur Rinpoche because these were people who devoted literally, at that time when uh, Rinpoche was first in our lab, we do this uh, very detailed structured interview to estimate the number of lifetime hours of meditation practice. And back in 2002, when we first tested Mingyur Rinpoche, that number was about 62,000 hours. Um, uh, and so we decided to start there because if we didn't see anything different in the brains of people who've spent so many years cultivating their mind, the likelihood of seeing things in more novice practitioners was not very um, hopeful. So that's where we began and uh, we did see some remarkable things um, very early on. And they helped us uh, to appreciate wisdom and compassion the themes that are so central to uh, Wisdom 2.0 and to the convening today. So uh, with that as a little introduction, uh, maybe Rinpoche, can, you can say a little bit about, um, uh, about the collaboration and then perhaps lead us uh, in a short practice to give us a little taste for what, uh, what this is that we're speaking about and then we can go back and forth for the rest of the time. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I went to your laboratory in 2002, and there's a lot of discussion um, about the meditation and science. So what I found is there are three important things. The first is um, neuroplasticity. So 20 years before, neuroscientists doesn't believe that brain has capable of change, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're born with unhappy, then you have no hope. <laughs> <laughs> Rest of your life will be unhappy. But then neuroplasticity says, there's hope, right? That's right. It can change. And not only that, now there's neurogenesis, neuropathways. So there's a wonderful. And in the meditation tradition, we also talk about the, how our mind is pliable, walkable through the meditation. So everybody can transform. There's uh, nothing that which is cannot be transformed if we practice, if we apply these meditation techniques. And second thing is this transformation is not only for the mind become more happy, but also it's a lot of physical benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So good for health. And the third is, so happy mind, healthy body, 
it's good for life, isn't it? Yeah. So that's not particular from your research, but I, I assume, of course. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was um, wonderful. Anyway, so how this meditative tradition we try to transform ourselves. Actually, what we call is self-transformation, self-antidote, self-liberation. So we are not trying to use antidote, something from outside. Actually, the problem is solution. So what we believe that we all have this basic goodness, our true nature. Our true nature is wonderful, awesome, pure, present, calm, and always there within us. Do you believe? Yes. Mm, good. <laughs> How many of you believe? Raise your hand. Oh, good. First time. When Very I select audience here. <laughs> <laughs> First time when I hear this from my, I, I learned this from my father, you know, when I was nine years old. I don't believe. He said, oh, you have wonderful nature. Your nature is perfect. I thought he, it's just sweet talk, you know. <laughs> that time I was having panic, panic attacks. I had panic when I was uh, seven, eight years old. I was not happy. And my father said, oh, you have this wonderful nature within you. <laughs> Ah, uh, another, you know, another sweet talk. But then, as I practice and try to connect with this, what we call awareness, compassion, love, wisdom, which is within us all the time. So once you try to connect with that, then you can discover, aha, you know, hmm. Each time there's the aha. So maybe, I would like to introduce you awareness. Do you want? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, awareness meaning knowing. Uh, how many of you can see my hand? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> so, you know my hand. So that's awareness. Awareness meaning knows what you are thinking, knows what you are doing, what you are feeling, what you are seeing, that's all. But that awareness is always together with thought, feeling, emotion, memory, so many things comes together. But the awareness itself it's beyond. Awareness is not thought. Awareness is not emotion. Emotion comes and goes. When the emotion is gone, awareness is not gone. So normally what we call awareness is like sky. And the thought, emotion is like cloud. So cloud comes and goes. Normally what happens for us is we are lost in the cloud and we don't see the sky. But the sky is there all the time, even the, sorry, yeah, even the sky is full of cloud. Dark, fuzzy, storm, wind, it doesn't change the nature of sky, right? So same as our awareness, 